Sometimes in turning on your television or possibly the radio, maybe sometimes you visited worship services of some other churches. And you've seen people begin to carry on something like this. And immediately they tell you they're speaking in tongues. So today I want to ask the question, what about tongue speaking? And when I just did that, I'm not just making fun of them. Although I would have let them see the truth. I remember the prophet Elijah taunting the prophets of Baal when he would not burn the sacrifice up because there was no Baal. And he said, cry a little louder. Maybe he's gone to sleep somewhere. <laughs> there is a proper place for that. But I want us to basically engage today in just what does the Bible say about speaking in tongues today. If you want to, you can turn to Acts chapter 2. And there on the day of Pentecost, when the church was established, we find in verse number 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, then, when this was noised abroad, what was noised abroad? Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. Not a rushing mighty wind, but a sound like one. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now all of that is noised abroad. The multitude comes together and they're amazed. They're confused. They're confounded. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. And then the list is given where all this multitude was from. And those tongues that they were speaking spoke the wonderful works of God. Verse 11. Now the crowd knew it meant something because they knew Galileans weren't noted for a lot of formal education. So how was it they were able to speak as if they'd been born in that language? Now remember the Koine Greek, common Greek, was what was throughout the whole of the empire, Roman empire. But here these fellows are speaking in the very languages of the places to where these people were located or born and grew up. They spoke these languages like a native. So when I hear people today claiming to be Christians, speaking what amounts to nothing but gibberish that has no markings of a legitimate language, and then I read the very Word of God, then where do you come up with that kind of thing? So it's worth studying. Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect through the furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 3, 16 and 17. So we begin by doing a little bit of... Uh, Defining. In fact, at the time the King James Version was translated, it's called King James because he authorized it to be translated, they used tongue and language interchangeably, just like it was used here by the inspired Luke when he wrote these words in <coughs> verse 6. But when you look at 
all of what the Bible, New Testament in particular, says. As to the usage of the word tongue. It's used, first of all, as the organ of the body involved in speech, of which we are to control, James chapter 3 and verse number 5. Then it is used as the quality of speech, Proverbs 28, 23. James again comments on it in chapter 3 and verse 6. And the third way is that it means a language whereby ideas are communicated. Daniel 1 verse 4, Acts 1 19, and chapter 26 of Acts verse 14. And that's whether the language was learned naturally or received as a miraculous gift. The religious movement of Pentecostalism today claims two classifications of the gift of tongues. They will talk about speaking with other tongues, and then they'll talk about speaking in unknown tongues. We'll have more to say about unknown tongues since that's actually used in the scriptures. And we also will speak to the other tongues, which is used by the Holy Spirit also. Now, other tongues are said to be, and they admit this, foreign languages. Initially, initially spoken as evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit baptism and experiencing salvation. Then, unknown tongues, I put that in quotes, are said to be heavenly ecstatic utterances continually spoken by some of those who are saved. And it's done for their own personal self-edification, Acts 2, verse 4. In other words, my gobbly, goobly, gibbly comments while ago wasn't for your benefit anyway. But it's for my benefit according to Pentecostalism and those who claim tongues today. That is, as a miraculous gift. There are three words that concern us in this study of what about tongue speaking today. Three words. The first one is sign, S-I-G-N. Then the word kind, K-I-N-D. And means, M-E-A-N-S. Sign, kind, and means. If you remember Mark's account of the Great Commission, and you read all the way down through verse 20, you'll find out that signs, or rather tongues, were given for a sign. Well, remember, a sign is never a sign of itself. Always point something else. I've often used this. You've heard me use it. But when you're looking for gasoline. And you see a sign. Saying here it is. You don't pull up to the sign itself. And expect to get gasoline out of it. But it is a sign. That gasoline's available there. We would call that basic common sense I think. By the word kind. It's our desire in this study to establish whether the languages were real, understandable languages or ecstatic utterances. And then by the word means, we want to determine how. How one received the gift of tongue. I suggest these questions are good for studying various other topics also. 
So as we explore the scriptures, we will be pointing out the sign, kind, and the means as we get into them. First, what about tongue speaking in the New Testament? Well, I've already noted from Acts chapter 2, tongues. And that's the first instance of tongue speaking in the New Testament. Only, only the 12 Jewish apostles spoke in tongues by means of Holy Spirit baptism. I suggest you go back and read Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 25, through chapter 2, and various verses. Chapter 2, verse 4, 7 to 14. Read the whole thing. As Brother Keeble just said, do you good. But that's how you find out where we want to begin about means. Now, I think we all know that all the Jews who were devout and trained had a knowledge of the Hebrew tongue. I've already pointed out to you, as you well know, that the Koine Greek, called Common Greek, which the New Testament was written in, was a universal language or a Roman Empire language, and the Jews would have known it. But you'll note on the day of Pentecost, all these people gathered from throughout the empire and then some, were amazed that the apostles from old backward Galilee could also speak in their local dialects wherein this multitude came from, wherein they were born, verse 6, 8, and 11. Now, some say the miracle was in the hearing. I've heard people say that, that the miracle was in the hearing as the apostles spoke in strange tongues or mainly only one language. Then God caused each person hearing them to interpret those sounds into his own language. But they don't realize what they've done. The Bible says it is a miracle of the tongue, not a miracle of the ear. But they would make it, when they get through reinterpreting, a miracle of the ear, when it's a miracle of the tongue. Some also contend that the apostles were all preaching in tongues. But it says they were preaching the wonderful works of God in real, genuine, live languages of the day. Verse 11 and the verses that follow after that. Now, this had gained the attention and the interest of those present. Well, it would have, too, if I heard something that sounded like a hurricane, but there wasn't any wind. It starts up and it comes down. I heard Brother G.K. Wallace say one time when he was debating these fellows, he said, uh, y'all got it right backwards. He said, what I hear here is starting down and going up on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't the wind, but it sounded like it and it came down. So if you're going to be a Pentecostal, and follow that as a pattern. It's got to not be a wind, but sound like a wind. It's got to start from on high and come down. But it doesn't today. It doesn't at all. So then the Apostle Peter explained the miracle. And then he launched into the preaching of the gospel. So the tongues on Pentecost, here's our word, were a sign. A sign to the multitude which confirmed the message of salvation that Peter and the other apostles were preaching. And it was done so, of course, so they could understand. They're intellectual. God doesn't bypass your intellectual powers. He works through language, signs of ideas to teach you the truth. And that's the way the Bible works. The Bible is a book of signs of ideas, words. If you want to know the mind of God, then he put his mind in the signs of ideas, vehicles of thought, and they're written down. So Paul could say, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge 
and the mystery of Christ. Now the second instance of tongue speaking we run into it at the household of Cornelius in the first at the conversion of the first uncircumcised Gentile. And Cornelius and his household did so by means of the Holy Spirit which came upon them. No man's involved here and later you will see that Peter says he rehearses this in Acts eleven. This was like it was at the beginning. Beginning of what? The church, like it was in Acts 2. There are other similarities between Acts 2 and Acts 10. But notice in the case of conversion of Cornelius, tongues were spoken before the gospel preached and before anyone believed in Christ based on the gospel. Acts 10, 44 through 46, and as Peter rehearsed it, Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. So then why were they done? To prove that God was behind the preaching of the gospel to uncircumcised Gentiles. And that the Gentiles had a right to the gospel just like every Jew did. And God didn't work through any man. He came directly as you please down from heaven and bestowed upon them what he had bestowed upon the apostles in the beginning as Peter said. So here they're a sign. Remember he had Jewish witnesses with him. They wouldn't have to bend or anything. They witnessed it. They could see how it compared to the day the church started and what happened with the apostles there. And thus the message of salvation was to be presented to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. Acts 11 and verse 18. The third instance of tongue speaking is in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. And this is where the Ephesians did so by, as our word means, of an apostle laying his hands on them. In this case, it was after they were baptized that took place. Acts 19, 5, and the verses following. Now Luke, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing about this, uses the Greek word glossa to describe all three occurrences of tongues found in Acts. Now, here's a point regarding rightly dividing the word of truth in the study of the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. Since Luke did not distinguish between this event in Ephesus, recorded in Acts 19, and the other two which involved real languages, we have the same in this case. Now this makes a point that needs to be kept in mind. Every time that glossa or tongues is used, God does not have to define it. And that's the reason I read what we did in the beginning. Because therein the Holy Spirit through Luke defined tongues to be language and language to be tongues. And they were languages all those people were speaking is living active languages. Now once it's defined that way, it remains that way. And the only way it wouldn't is if God stepped in and gave you a different definition on a different occasion. But he doesn't. We cannot place a new meaning on this word glossa, transliterated G-L-O-S-S-A, that is not given in the text. Now we've appealed strictly to the text and the definition of tongue. And we saw how tongue and language and language and tongue were used interchangeably to mean real active languages and even gives the people where they were from and how well were they spoken. Sounds like right back from home. So these tongues by the Ephesians were a sign to the Jews that John's message had been replaced. Because you remember, Paul had done a little interrogating here and found out they didn't know the whole gospel as it was to be preached in the Great Commission. They had only learned of John's baptism. And they had to be baptized again. Now why? Because they heard John's baptism, believed and obeyed it after it was abrogated. After the Great Commission baptism had come into effect. 
And there was some interrogation went on, which ought to tell us something about asking people what they believe and why they believe it. Because Paul asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? I always liked their answer. They didn't believe punches. We don't know where there is a Holy Spirit. Well, now that would tell me something just like I told him. You couldn't have been baptized under Great Commission baptism because you would be baptized under that in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they were assigned to the Jews that John's message had been replaced. And replaced by what? The gospel of Jesus Christ, God's power to save, Romans 1.16. And thus they served as a confirmation. That thing's over and done with. It was fine while it was in effect and for what God sent it for, just like the law of Moses was fine. While it was in effect and the Jews approached God for 1,500 years through the law of Moses, but it had done its due, and the whole writer of Hebrews, or the writer of Hebrews, makes that clear. You can't approach God anymore, Jews, and expect to be accepted by the law of Moses. And you can't give up the New Testament system and go back into the law of Moses, because you will have done despite of the Spirit of grace. You can't do that. The fourth instance of tongue speaking is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And this is where the Corinthian brethren were rebuked for their abuse and misuse of the gift of tongues. I just ask you simply to go over there and read that. And you can read all of the gifts that came through the laying on of the apostles' hands in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you, there's nine of them. The apostles had all nine of them. Plus one, they could lay hands on somebody and impart one of these miraculous gifts. Now, consistency would keep the meaning of the word tongue the same as in the book of Acts. There's no reason to change it over to some sort of something that's not a real language. And since the three occasions in Acts for tongue speaking are in Acts 2, Acts 10, and Acts 19, and all were real languages... And Paul was in the city of Corinth in Acts 18, and he was there to bestow the gift of tongues to some of the members. Why should this gift be any different in its interpretation? It is a language. I'll tell you, when you've gone overseas and preached and preached through a translator, sometimes you just yearn to have had such a gift as that, and that's one reason that it was given so the gospel could be gotten out very quickly. If you ever study the language, you'll know that before you get proficient in it, you've got to spend a lot of time with it. And I talked to a man some years ago who had been five years in the country studying the language. He so said, I just now got to where I will attempt the sermon in it. And I have to write it out first then. Because it's so easy to say the wrong thing. When you think about how we preachers in preaching from English that we born in and grew up say the wrong thing not intending to, well imagine in a second second tongue, a second language. I remember one time in Russia, you'd have to know how Murmont's Russia is built. It's built on the side of a hill going down to a bay. So there's big terraces. And there's steps going all the way up on both sides of that street that went down where every Russian town is, Lenin Street, and that's the main street, so that's where you'd go. And, of course, when we were over there, as you well know, those who remember when I went, it was in late February, and it got a little cold when you're above the Arctic Circle in February. And uh, I remember one morning by myself going down to church services, and you had to walk all the way down these steps. And this little Russian lady about this tall and everybody's all bundled up and I could tell when I walked up there she wanted to grab my arm and steady herself as we went down because I mean that black eye says you'll throw yourself in a split second and, and you do <laughs> and they do by the way and she talked I've been around some of my American ladies who could do that all the way down several hundred yards to Lenin Street and I said nothing and I'm dressed up pretty much like a Russian dress and she's talking to the store I have no idea what she's saying 
And when we get down to where she wants to go off her direction, I have already started thinking, oh, I wish I could communicate with her. I made a perfect contact, and I can't communicate with her. So I don't know how people go over there and stay and not learn the language if they're going to be over there a long time, whether it's that country or any other place. But I never will forget when we got right to the bottom and she turned around and thanked me. Spasiba. And uh, she wanted to talk to me. And I said, get Ruski, da Amerikanski. She goes, Amerikanski. Amerikanski. Oh, Amerikanski. And she walks off laughing. That's my communication. But see, without a language that communicates ideas and everybody understanding the language and how it works, you can't communicate. And the whole idea of a language is communication. And it's defined that way in the infallible Word of God by the Holy Spirit and the inspired writers. In fact, if you'll read in your King James Version the epistle dedicatory, You'll see that when he is, uh, when the, whoever wrote that preface or dedicatory part, he'll use language and tongues, and that was in 1611, interchangeably, just like Luke did over here in Greek 2,000 years before. Now Paul proves that real languages were under consideration. He does this by two major arguments. And the first argument speaks of language in the world. Verse 10, the verses following. And the second argument compares, remember we started with this, other tongues to real languages of the Old Testament. And the day of Pentecost, verse 21. Isaiah 28, 11 through 13. You won't jot it down. Isaiah 28, 11 through 13. And Acts 2, verse 4. In writing that letter to the Corinthians where they were abusing these particular gifts, and especially the gift of tongues, Paul reminds the Corinthian brethren that these tongues were for a sign, a sign not to believers, not to Christians, not to members of the church, but they were assigned to unbelievers. Chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. Well, can you imagine if we were back in that time and we all speak English, but an apostle has been here and he's laid hands on us. We don't have a written New Testament to study as they did at Corinth, but we have the miraculous gifts. And somebody comes in that doesn't speak our local language. And whoever it is that speaks in tongues can just start talking to him. And he'll sound to him just like he was born right there and grew up where this fellow grew up. Look how quickly that would mean that we could teach and preach. Now this has been, and it's been meant to be, a very plodding along, setting out systematically, what the Bible had to say about tongues. And in closing, I would say finally, if tongue speaking took place today, then it would take place because the Holy Spirit provided that miraculous ability of a person to do it. Whether it came through apostles' hands or whatever. Of course, there's a lot of things and problems there. There are no apostles around. We'll say that in a minute. But the rules for the use of these gifts would have to be followed. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 14, you have rules from the Holy Spirit in this letter written by an apostle who would have been one that laid hands on them and imparted these gifts, telling them how to use them. And if people were having, had them today, they would be obliged to follow the same rules. And yet some of the people that claim to have these miracles, especially the tongues, completely neglect the rules of usage that are found in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, how could that be? They're completely ignored by Pentecostalism. In fact, one of the things is how women did things. Well, some of the people speaking tongues among the Pentecostals were the women. <laughs> 
And they don't show any proper control of themselves relative to the rest of the teaching of the Bible on a woman teaching over or exercising dominion over a man. Not at all. But they did then. So-called tongue speaking today is nothing more than a psychological phenomenon. It's a, an extremely, an extreme emotional reaction to certain teachings in environmental situations coupled with a desire to obtain instant spirituality. You might be surprised since the original miraculous gifts died when the last apostle died and the last one they laid hands on, they ceased to be in the church. If you read in the first century or so after the first century, guess what they had a problem with? People speaking in tongues, basically, as it's defined nowadays by Pentecostals. They missed it, and people going wrong doctrinally begin to come up with all these things. And what's gone around once tends to come around, whether it's separated by 2,000 years or two weeks. But it helps us to understand because it shows us, and it fits into a study, of the design and the purpose of miracles in the church in the first place. I'll close with this little tale. You may have heard me tell it before, but back in 1976 or somewhere along in there, Brother Guy Woods debated a Mr. Hicks, who was one of their leading debaters of the United Pentecostal Church International Incorporated. And he was challenging Brother Woods is speaking tongues because they teach that if you're saved, one of the signs of other tongues is that you're given that to show you are saved. Well, Brother Woods let that go on long enough where he ran himself out on the limb, that is, Hicks had. And the next thing you know, Brother Woods stands up and quotes in Hebrew something. And the guy made light of it. But that wasn't really what it was. Brother Woods said it, I don't know why, I said it's the first I think two verses of Genesis chapter 1 and that seems to me came from the Holy Spirit through Moses and you have the Holy Spirit and claim that all these people have the Holy Spirit and you don't even recognize it and that's one of the ways you deal with people who claim miracles today is to show they can't do it and then teach the truth about miracles even as we have on tongues today and if that will not turn somebody around and head in the right direction from the wrong direction, there's not much more you can do. Now, if you're not a Christian, we haven't studied in detail what to do to become a Christian, but we urge you now is the time to do that and then spend your life studying the Scriptures on things like this to write by the word of truth and know better how to deal with error in the world, to believe that Christ, the Son of God, repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him and be baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you have sinned, then you need to repent of those sins. Come confess to Him. We'll pray with you and for you for forgiveness. And God and His love for us has promised to forgive. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.